is kind of tackle something uh, that you don't normally get. And so uh, what I figured I would do is um, the, the fascinating uh, times that we're living in is kind of a reversal of history almost. Uh, we're getting a, a throwback to uh, some old things that we've had to deal with in the past. Jude, the servant of Jesus Christ and brother of James, to them that are sanctified by God the Father and preserved in Christ and called. Yes. Mercy unto you and peace and love be multiplied. Mm -hmm. Beloved, when I, get, when I gave all diligence to write unto you the common salvation, it was needful for me to write unto you and exhort you <coughs> that you should earnestly contend for the faith which was once delivered unto the saints. So uh, what Jude says is he said, I wanted to write to you about this, but I was compelled. I was driven. I had to write to you about something else. I, I was pressed by the Spirit to say that you should earnestly contend uh, for the faith. Now the interesting thing is, is when you talk about uh, contending for the uh, faith... Uh, we are uh, called, Brother Hertz, uh, called to defend our faith. And what, what that means is, is we have now the emergence of something new. And what I say new, but it, it, I guess it's really something old, but kind of resurgence. When I say you're called to defend your faith, that's what Christianity is called to do. Now today, we're living primarily in a world where um, Christian assumptions are no longer the consensus. All you have to do is walk out in the culture, and you will see that that's true. I was talking to uh, Brother Naylor, Brother Rodenbush, and uh, Brother Arcade Rodenbush, and Brother Gowie, and we were sitting around uh, chatting before Brother Naylor left out of town. And Brother Rodenbush Sr. was talking about the switching culture. And you're living in a day where uh, there is new challenges because you are ultimately living in a time where Christian assumptions are no longer the shared consensus in America. What you uh, used to have is someone, even a, an atheist, would say, uh, well, they'd say, what do you think about those Ten Commandments? And they'd say, well, I don't believe in the Bible, but those Ten Commandments are probably a good way to order your life. Uh, but now we're living in something where we have uh, something new. The emergence of a more belligerent and I would say a more effective uh, atheism. Right, what that looks like today is you have uh, Richard Dawkins, the Oxford bi uh, biologist, uh, wrote the book called The God Delusion. Anyone ever heard of that book? Okay, what's fascinating to me is I, I was just teaching in Mankato at Hendry Herbst's church. And when I asked just the church members, how many have ever heard of the God Delusion and Richard Dawkins? I was shocked at the number of hands that went up. If some of you had the opportunity to serve on youth committees, I think you should shape what's taught. I think you should shape the way we do camps. I think you, you have to shape or redo the way that we do hyphen events. Because we're losing the battle right there. 75 to 90% of Christians that say they believe in God lose their faith, walk away from God in college. Those are staggering statistics. And it's simply because of this, this new agenda and this uh, kind of aggressive, uh, what someone has called, you ready? Evangelical atheism. And that means that an atheism that's out to convert you. And Jared, you said it, and I, I wish I could have you up here and just talk about your experiences at Butler University, where you're in class and they, they have a, a, you ready, a, a preacher almost, a motivational speaker talking about the importance of believing in atheism. And Jared said to me, and everyone forget these words, he said it exactly right, uh, this experience of multiple students, by the way, that I talked to, they said they had everything, a, a, a powerful presentation, a compelling argument to be atheist, and, and that's going to make you a better person, that's what you should be, they had everything but an altar call. Right? Good. If you, and if you don't know what that looks like, I would challenge you to speak to maybe Jared or pull some of these other students aside and kind of find out what that looks like. So they're going to chase Christianity into the private uh, sphere. And, and the third thing about the new agenda is that they're self-consciously targeting young people. Okay? Uh, uh, they know that they're not the majority right now. But what they're doing is they say, uh, we're going to use education, the techniques of education, science and skepticism and questioning to deprogram religion out of, the, uh, out of this generation. They, they, this is what they say. 
I know you're going to be a youth pastor, a pastor, or a parent, or, or in ministry somewhere, and you're going to program Christianity into them. But then guess what? you got to turn them over to us and the institutions. And they say we have these uh, wonderful positions at, at the institutions or, or in the um, um, education or media. And when you program them, when you turn them over to us, we'll take it out of them. How effective is it? Well, I've already told you, 75 to 90% of professing Christians leave college saying, I no longer believe in, in Christianity. Right? So I would say then that this agenda is different, and I think it's very, very uh, effective. The third thing is I think what Christians can find themselves in, because we're living kind of in a new day, is they can find themselves becoming defensive without really knowing how to defend. Now, why is that so? Well, uh, where am I? Anybody in contemporary theology? Okay. All right. <laughs> Postmodernism actually... In, in many ways, the Christianity was beneficial. I know it's terrible to say, but it's actually true. Why is that true? Because you could say to a postmodernist, uh, let me tell you what Jesus has done in my life. Let me tell you my experience with God. And people would say, wow, as a postmodernism, that's your experience. I believe experience is powerful. Now, what, what we used to say is the Bible says da 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 But this is what happens today uh, when you bump into atheism and kind of the growing consensus today. They reject experience and the Bible and say we want only reason uh, to speak to us. And so when you say, well, Mr. Christian, why do you believe in this? They would say, well, you know, the book of Leviticus says this. Romans chapter 1 says this. Uh, or whichever passage you use. Well, they would say, well, I refuse to let the Bible adjudicate the matter. I refuse to let the Bible be the source of authority because I reject it. And sometimes we can be stumped because that was kind of our argument. All right? So uh, when they reject the Bible, what do we do? Well, here's one thing that I think atheism does in a very effective way. They find Christians on campuses and they ask them questions that no matter how long you spend in Sunday school, hint, hint, change what you're doing. Uh, that you never uh, hardly, uh, in most cases, uh, hear treated. For instance, they will say something like this. Now, you say you're a Christian, but have you researched all the religions? Have you kind of had this independent research and survey of all the religions of the world? Have you spent the time researching what you believe is uh, right and, and comparing that with all the other religions of the world? Well, no. Uh, this is what they would say. Your belief, you ready, is an accident of birth, not intentional thought or conviction. For instance, they would say, if you were born in Tibet, you would more than likely be a Buddhist. Or if you were born in Afghanistan, you would be a Muslim. So your religion is just an accident of birth, not thought, not critical research. It's the fact that you were raised in Mankato, Minnesota. Or, uh, you know, Indianapolis, Indiana. Uh, and that's why you're a Christian. How do you know that when the last call comes in, as one man said, it's not going to be Salt Lake City? <clears throat> Big surprise, right? Yeah. Mormons are right. All right, so that's, that's the kind of arguments uh, that, that you're going to face, that they're kind of uh, using on contemporary camp campuses. So what I'm saying then is what worked in the past will not work for us today because times have changed. John Mark Montgomery in a little book called The Suicide of Christian Theology says this. If you're not careful, you will be guilty of being a museum piece. A museum piece that spoke to things powerfully in the past, but today uh, has no relevance whatsoever. Right? So learn kind of the, the spirit of the age and what you need to wrestle with as people call to defend the faith. Okay? Uh, so uh, what most people have then is what you've heard me call a uh, crown Christianity. Right? Crown Christianity. What does that look like? Well, it's the Christianity you kind of learn at your mom and dad's feet. And that's good. Right? It's what got you here. 
But at some point, you need to become more critical, not like bad critical, but analytical, careful, study about what, uh, why you believe what you believe. I mean, you will hear somebody on campus, you will get to the normal college campus in America, and they would say, well, well, Jared, do you actually believe someone walked on water? Do you believe if someone raised someone from the dead? I mean, don't you believe in kind of fixed, incorrigible laws that govern the universe? How can you believe in something like that? And what you'll find, and, and what you're going to face, and what your students are going to face, and what your church members are going to face more in the common culture, is this crayon Christianity is going to come under withering, skeptical attack. And a lot of times, if you're not careful, you're going to find yourself, in the, or they're going to find themselves in the position of being defensive without ground to defend. And I think this is an intentional strategy, by the way, to drive a wedge between your heart at one level and your mind uh, in the other. All right, so what I thought I would do kind of tonight um, is to focus on some of the strongest ar arguments of atheism. Now, uh, as one man put it, you don't do that in a debate. You would just, you would kind of look for the uh, weakest points and attack the foundation. But what I thought is we kind of look at some of the most, uh, the strongest arguments of atheism that you're going to face. What face? What I I want to talk about tonight, you can find in a, a couple of really great books. One is called What's So Great About Christianity by Dinesh D'Souza. I know where's is Sister Nancy in here? Yeah. Oh, she's like she's. I'm like wrecking her finances. It's terrible. <laughs> and the other one is a, a really great one, probably the best one. I've read currently, uh, in terms of a new book for me, is What's So Great, uh, Our Christianity on Trial. That's a great book. I, I know some students have already bought it. Uh, so it's a, a great, great book. All right, so uh, what some people will say, I love uh, this little statement. They would say, but Brother Kilman, aren't these uh, people, PhDs, really respected people in academia? academia? That's right. But, you know, education is only one way to get people past, educated past their knowledge. Or to say it another way, there's, there's some stupid you can only get to by being educated. <coughs> or to say it biblically, the world through wisdom knew not God. Amen. Or as Jared, Jared, I'm telling you, as Jared said one time, the highest level you can ever seek to achieve in academia is to be a professor. The Bible says, uh, professing themselves wise, they became fools. That's true. Okay, it was a joke. I mean, you can chuckle. All right, so uh, what are some of the strongest arguments they make? Well, number one, they would say this. You don't need God to be good. Now, I don't think, how many of you think that only Christians are good? Now, you could say only Christians are righteous. That's something else. But I don't think we hold the corner on the market of being good. Uh, God bless everybody who's not Christian, who's out there in the culture doing good. Uh, Christopher Hitchens said this. He was in a debate. He said, you Christians make me sick. I love Hitchens. He's awesome. Uh, he says, uh, you're, you got your stupid bumper stickers. What would Jesus do? As if that's going to make you a better, a kinder, a more generous, or even uh, some type of more moral person. He said, there's nothing that uh, a Christian can do that an atheist or non-Christian couldn't equally do. I mean, if you see some uh, conflict in Rwanda and all of these people are displaced, he said the Christian can shed a tear and send some money and some food or dig a well or do all these things. He said, that's nothing that an atheist couldn't do. Right? And, and, and that's true. I wouldn't argue that they couldn't do that. But the question is, is where do values come from? All right? So uh, we, can, we need to look at virtues, but I wouldn't even just say Christian virtues. Let's lay that aside for a second. And let's just look at one, the virtues that say uh, atheists revere. Uh, things like this. The idea of the individual or the right to dissent. Or science is an independent and an autonomous enterprise. Or the equal dignity of women. Or the abolition of slavery. slavery or, or compassion as a social, social virtue. Uh, most of them, uh, if not all of them in some way, came into the West or into the world even some of them because of Christianity. Right? Now, how do we know this? Well, one way to know this is to simply look at other cultures. 
These virtues were downplayed or non-existence, uh, non-existent in other uh, uh, cultures. For instance, Greece and Rome, before uh, Christianity was ever birthed, these virtues were largely absent. For instance, in Aristotle, he has this list of virtues, and compassion doesn't even hit the list. I mean, compassion, a very important a virtue in our society, uh, he lists almost as a vice. Okay? Or uh, the idea of life having importance. Well, when you look at the ancient Spartans, they, were, they would take a, a sick child, they would put it in the snow, and they were very happy to find it dead in the morning. All right? And it's not until, uh, you know, the, even when you look at like the ancient Greek philosophers, uh, of Greece, kind of the heavyweights of their day, they knew of this uh, practice, but were largely unmoved by it. Why? Because the idea of the sanctity of life was a Christian virtue. All right, so it, it didn't become an important uh, uh, principle of governing a society until we had the society that later would be called a Christendom. So even secular virtues have a Christian foundation, and often atheism is standing on this foundation, this mountain, and, and not willing to give um, um, acknowledgement to it. And I think that's just unthankful. For instance, uh, I heard in a debate, and that's why I, re I really like, well, he's not up there anymore, but I really like Christopher Hitchens uh, as, in terms of the atheist because he was the most consistent and I think the most honest with his own worldview. He said, I'm not sure we're endued with inalienable rights. All right now, why did he say that? Because in the Constitution, Jefferson said, I, we're endued with inalienable rights uh, by what? Our. Creator. Creator. Right? And if we are just one more step above from the animals, then I think that's, uh, that's exactly right. Because Jefferson, uh, who didn't even read his Bible without a handy pair of scissors close. Literally. Anybody ever seen that Jefferson's Bible? How many have never heard of Jefferson and the way he treated his Bible? <coughs> okay, so he was like a, 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 a wild dude. He was not considered a good Christian. Because he would come along to something supernatural in the Bible, and you know what he'd do? He'd cut it out. All right, so even Jefferson, when he was framing the Constitution, the only reason that he could think that human beings had inalienable rights, he had nothing in society to unite that under. It had to be under, underneath the notion that we're created in the image of God. And that's the only reason he could uh, make that argument. The, the second thing... Uh, that atheism will kind of use in this uh, uh, you don't need God to be good is, well actually religion is evil okay I was, uh, um, and this is what they would say it's uh, actually religion is responsible for the greatest atrocities in history how many have ever heard that argument okay All right good oh, not good that you uh, that it's, you know what you know all right, there was an article written, and let, let me read, to, read it to you, and you can kind of get the flavor of what this would look like. They say, uh, this is a response that an atheist is writing against 9-11, and, and by the way, I think this is a very savvy way they found to kind of surf uh, the, the edge of current events, kind of giving them a level of popularity never heard of before. I mean, most of atheism was talked about in little esoteric circles, mostly. But today they found ways to get into kind of current events. Look at, look at what our article says. Uh, the war on terror is a war of competing fundamentalisms. On the one side, Christian fundamentalism. On the other side, Islamic fundamentalism. What do these two groups have in common? They're fueling their fanaticism at the same holy gas station. Religion. Religion is the problem. So 9-11 could be called, rightly, a faith-based initiative. He said, look around the world, and any rational person would see that the source of terrorism, conflict, and war is religion. Why are the Shia fighting the Sunni? Religion. Why are the Israelis fighting the Palestinians? Religion. 
Look at Northern Ireland. Why is there that conflict there? Well, again, religion. He says, and a backward glance at history shows the same. I mean, the Crusades, the Inquisitions, the religious wars, the Salem witch trials. Any rational person would have to conclude that belief in God is a menace to human civilization. If we could get rid of God and have a, a secular society, it would not only be a more rational and scientific but a more decent and more peaceful society. Okay? So this is the first time in history we've had people say that I'm an atheist and by that mean I'm a more ethical and more moral person. Right? That's something new in our society. Alright? So here's the question you need to ask. Is it true that most war and conflict is over religion? Well, I'm just going to tell you, no. Why are the Israelis uh, fighting the Palestinians? Well, it's not about religion. It's about land. They're not saying, I, I, I don't think you should, uh, you know, be kosher. Let's not eat this bacon. <laughs> bang, 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 bang. No. <laughs> I don't want to make it. Why are the Hindus fighting the Muslims? Well, again, it's not about uh, whether or not you're following the five pillars of Islam. It's about Kashmir. It's about land. Why are the Catholics fighting the Protestant, Protestants in Northern Ireland? It's not about, you know, whether or not the be, literally becomes the body and blood. It's not about transubstantiation. It's about who gets to control the country. For instance, one guy said that uh, there was a guy uh, walking down the street of Belfast in a a man sticks a gun in his back and he says, are you Catholic or Protestant? And the guy's, you know, he's nervous and he understandably looks over his shoulder and he says, well, uh, actually I'm atheist. And the guy said, are you uh, Catholic or Protestant atheist? <laughs> 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 All right, so mostly it, when you look at the wars of history, uh, it's mostly about control and power and land and money. Most of those things. All right, uh, I was uh, I was riding down the road and I was listening to NPR maybe uh, just a month, uh, not even a month ago, right before I actually went to Mankato to your church, and NPR was talking about the uh, Inquisitions, and what's peculiar about modern history today is the crimes of religion are wildly exaggerated, and the crimes of atheism are downplayed or ignored. All right, for instance, uh, how many people uh, do you think were killed in the Salem witch trials? Anybody want to make a guess? How many people, if you know the answer, please don't tell the answer. But if you had to guess, how many people were killed in the Salem witch trials? Who, who will hazard a guess? Don't tell if you know the answers. Who, who says? Yes? Six. Don't tell. Don't tell the answers if you don't. Know. Six. Yeah. How many people in the Salem witch trials? Anybody think it's more than six? Yeah. Yeah. How many? Yeah. Let's say thirties. Thirties? Yeah. Before I researched it, I thought it was in the sixties. I was pretty sure I'd been told that. Yeah, in the sixties. Uh, you could you could actually uh, when you are how many how many were slaughtered in the Inquisitions? Noticeably, uh, uh, notably rather the the Spanish Inquisition. It lasted for uh, centuries. I mean, when you look at it in history, you're thinking how many. I mean, most of, if you had asked me before I found out, I would have thought in the Salem witch trials. I, I mean, how many have ever? How many of you have been to college and you studied like McCarthyism through uh, the Scarlet Letter? Anybody read the Scarlet Letter in college? Okay, all right. So that's a study of McCarthyism, and and I would have thought maybe hundreds or thousands of people were ki killed in the uh, Salem witch trials. All right, how many was killed in the Spanish Inquisition? It was the worst, and it lasted for some three hundred years. How many would you hazard a guess was killed in, in, the, in the Inquisitions? I mean, anybody heard about the Inquisitions? Yeah. Okay. How many? Take a guess. Hazard a guess. 200, 300? 1,000? Yeah. Okay. Huh. Anybody else have a guess? I mean, I, I, you, I would think, I mean, the normal, I would tell you what the normal guesses are on those things. But some people would say hundreds of thousands, maybe millions. I mean, it was 300 years. It was the worst one. Haven't you seen the pictures? You know, 
know, and you got people lined up in and, and, and huge piles of bodies. Okay, uh, there, the fascinating thing is there is a large and reliable body of, of, of scholarship on this. Uh, Henry Kamen is the expert on the, uh, on the Inquisitions, on the Spanish Inquisition. And how many people were killed in the Spanish Inquisition? Well, it was the worst. It lasted for 375 years. There were about 2,000 people killed. All right? Now, I'm not, I wasn't a math major. That my wife was the math major. And uh, I don't know what that would look like, but if you divide 375 years uh, and about 2,000 people, that's about six people a year. More people die from hammers. <laughs> I mean, it's not, it's not normally a world catastrophic event. Okay? I was listening to a guy. Okay, yes, sir. Who was the expert you just quoted? Henry Kamen. Okay, how many were killed in the uh, Salem witch trials? Well, if you go to Salem, Massachusetts today, I'll just tell you, as one guy said, you know, it's absolutely true, the, the, the witches are doing well. Uh, as a matter of fact, many of them are tour guides. And if you look at, their, um, if you look at their, their brochures, it will tell you how many people were killed in the Salem witch trials. 19. All right, now I see, like, you had a shocked look. I mean, because you're thinking, I'm telling you, when you hear these uh, histories, is that 19 too many? Absolutely. Or 2019 too many? Absolutely. But what's, what's the point? Here, atheists are crying these huge crocodile tears, right? Over something that happened 200, 500, or 1,000 years ago that can never be reduplicated. Uh, but they'll ignore and downplay the vastly greater crimes of atheism. And I'm not talking about in ancient times, but in living memory. And people will say, well, who, who do you mean, Brother Kilwin? Are you talking about, about Mao Zedong in China or Stalin in Russia or the Nazi regime in Germany? Well, yes, but that's only the tip of the atheist icebergs. And in six de decades, uh, those uh, three people were able to wipe out close to 100 million people. I mean, that's an Olympian accomplishment in terms of killing people. But there's more than that. How about Lenin or Khrushchev or Bresnov or Andropov or uh, Sheremenko in the Soviet Union? Or Kim Jong-il or Fidel Castro or uh, Kalchescu? The list goes on and on. Or take a kind of what someone has said, a, a little league player, Paul Pot. His Khmer Rouge uh, regime in Vietnam in three years killed two million people. When we left Vietnam. By the way, that's, there's, a, there's a reason we fought that war. And the liberals are wrong. It was a good war. We should have stayed a one. Yeah. Right? And if you want a great book on that, Slouching Towards Gabar by Judge Borg. Alright? Now, here's the thing. Two million people. Look, Osama bin Laden in his wildest dreams could never accomplish killing two million people. And yet they're saying, well, look at this radical Islam. It's religion. When you have all of these uh, different people that are, not only is it more, it's closer and still a present threat. I mean, we could talk about abortion in China. I'll, I'll leave that alone. I need to get too close to America. But that's where we would get someone like Richard Dawkins that would come in and say, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. There's a critical distinction that you need to make here. Christians killed in the name of Christianity. Atheists, atheists did not. And this is where, you know, uh, Richard Dawkins is a respected biologist. But this is what happens when you let the biologist out of the laboratory. <laughs> because uh, the guy doesn't know history, evidently, at all. All you have to do is crack the, the collective works of Karl Marx, and you'll see that atheism is not a peripheral issue. It's absolutely central. When the uh, brother and sister Rodenbush were smuggling Bibles into China... They were pulled into a room, and one of the guards looked at Sister Rodenbush and said, uh, you're, you're a drug dealer. And she said, well, what are you talking about? He said, you're smuggling opium into the country. And what did he mean? Well, Karl Marx said that, uh, that religion is the opiate or the opium of the people. It keeps them dumbed down so that they don't resist and throw off tyranny. 
Right? And if you're going to create the new utopia and the new man, then what you have to do is do away with religion. And that's exactly what uh, these uh, people had to do. Right? So he, Mark said the only, only by abolishing religion can you create the new man and the new utopia. So atheism then, not religion, is responsible for the mass murders of history. Um, and that's, that's absolutely true. Uh, the second big argument that they make is science is simply a better way of knowing. All right? And so they would say, well, if you look at the flat earth and heliocentrism and Darwinism, a science is uh, on advancing unceasingly while Christianity is in humiliating and unceasing retreat. Why? Well, they would see, well, ancient man looked out of his cave, and when he saw a phenomenon, there was a lightning bolt, he would say, ooh, what is that? Must have been the lightning god, right? And, and, and now we know that lightning is an, an electrical discharge. So God is superfluous. God has to get something else to do with himself. Because we no longer need God to explain phenomenon because now science is simply a better way of knowing. So they would say, first of all, look at, uh, look at what Christianity said. The earth is flat. And medieval Christianity thought this until the brilliant scientists come along and, and then all of a sudden, no, it's round. And there they are embarrassing thousands of years of religious hocus pocus. And then they would say, well, look, well, those poor Christians believe that the earth was the center of the universe. But it's not. Then we find heliocentrism is true, that the, actually the earth revolves around the sun. So first Copernicus and then Galileo show that it's the other way around. And then Christianity believed that God made everything after its kind. I mean, you can't believe that. It's kind of a genesis. It's kind of hysterical. Until the patron saint of atheism, Darwin, would come along and show, no, that, that you don't need God, that it's actually chance and natural selection that can uh, account for everything. So what they do is they build this case that science is a better way of knowing ba based on three things. The flat earth... Uh, uh, the heliocentrism and Darwinism. But when you look at this uh, three-pronged stand, actually the foundation is really weak. So what about the flat earth theory? Well, if you just, and then by the way, remember, you can't bring the Bible to this because they reject it, right? Mm -hmm. All right, so what you would do is you would say, all you have to do is a little historical research and find out that educated people in the Middle Ages knew the earth was round. As a matter of fact, educated people at the time of Christ knew that the earth was round. 500 years before Christ, the Greeks knew that the earth was round. So uh, virtually no one in history taught that the earth was flat. Uh, it was only about four centuries ago that, that that position was made. How did they know that the earth was round? Well, it was very simple. You don't need a telescope. All you have to do is watch an eclipse. There's the sun. There's the earth. There's the moon. You can see the shadow of the earth on the moon. Wow. Look, fellas, it's round. Right? So right there, you see that Aristotle knew. Just look at the writing of Aristotle. They knew that the earth was round. As a matter of fact, when you go to Isaiah 40, 22, it talks about God sitting on the circle of the earth. And in Hebrew, that's sphere. So guess what? Even the Bible says that the earth is round. And by the way, this myth that Christians thought the earth was flat is so prevalent, and it is a myth, by the way, uh, that, that it's found. How many of you have seen that in a textbook? Absolutely. Right? And, and that's a, a myth that was concocted to discredit the critics of uh, Darwinism. Well, how about uh, heliocentrism or, or geocentrism? Which way is it? Well, when you look in the Bible to talk about whether or not we can endorse heliocentrism, there's nothing in Scripture that rejects that. There's a guy occasionally who'll look out the window and say the sun rose, or from the rising of the sun to the going down of the same. And then you have the atheist saying, aha, look, see these poor new Christians. But you know, if I get up early in the morning, I found, uh, how many of you have heard on the radio, the sun rose at 6.30 this morning. You might have heard that on the radio. Okay, that guy's not stupid. He knows that the earth is not the center of the universe. It's written from the human perspective. So guess what? It's allowable human language to make an argument against the Bible. That's just ridiculous. The third uh, issue, Darwinism. Right? Uh, you cannot today postulate an eternal universe. 
I, I wish I had more time to spend on this, but I don't. I'll, I'll just give you two of the best arguments from atheism on this. It would say, if you look at Darwin, Darwin says there are such things called multiverses. It's like, uh, well, what do you mean multiverses? He says, actually, what we have is we have our universe, and then there are these other multiverses out there. And this is the one where life exists, and we know. And they said, wow, that's very interesting. Uh, do you have any evidence for this? And he said, well, no. And he said, well, uh, but you're on the cutting edge of science, and, and pretty soon, how long before you have evidence? 10 years? 15 years? 100 years? He said, uh, no, we'll never have evidence. Because, I mean, these universes operate by different laws, so we could never see them. He says, man, so this is what you're telling me. You're going to do away with one creator to postulate uh, almost an infinite number of multiverses that you can't see. He said, I wish I could go with you, but I don't have enough faith. <laughs> see, <laughs> see, that's where science, that, now look, that's where you have to kind of get where actually science, or, or at least in terms of atheism, you need more faith to believe in atheism in Christianity. Or Stephen Hawkins, who uh, is a brilliant, <laughs> He's kind of a brilliant guy. You're pretty smart most of the time. Mm -hmm. But he would say, um, there could have been a time, we know from the second law of thermodynamics, you roll the ball across the floor, what happens? All right, you roll the ball across the floor, what happens? It's gonna slow it slows down. down and stops. It's called the law of entropy. The second law of thermodynamics says that all things lend to entropy. They kind of wind down. And so scientists are saying that uh, the universe is going to die, what, a cold death. And, I, and so if the universe was eternal, guess what? It would have burned out a long time ago. So scientists are now saying that the universe had to have a finite beginning a certain amount of time ago. As a matter of fact, Robert Jastrow, a NASA scientist who's also an atheist, says the frustrating thing about history and science is it kind of reads like a horror story for the atheist who's put his confidence in naturalism. He said they're climbing the, the, the mountain of ignorance and as they get to the top and they're climbing over the last rock, they get to the top and what do they find? A band of theologians <laughs> who have been there for centuries. All right, and that's true. So how does Stephen Hawkins uh, handle this? He said, well, there could have been a time before, all right, catch that. If you want a fun study, Every time you read an article like this, just underline and hide. I do this for kids. I shouldn't. I'm kind of facetious. Right after the effort. But just underline or highlight. Could have, probably, perhaps, might. It gets hysterical after a while. All right? So they said, well, it could have been that before the, uh, the Big Bang, that the universe actually operated by a different set of laws. And so that the second law of thermodynamics wouldn't adhere until after the Big Bang. And you would say, that's, that's incredible. That's logically consistent. But what evidence do you have for that, Mr. Hawkins? Absolutely not. Well, I don't have enough faith to believe it. Right? And so, uh, it's, uh, is there anything? No, it's, it's evidence of what I'm going to call blind faith. All right? <laughs> so here's the problem. They're used to you quoting scripture, but they're not uh, in, in, in saying the Bible says this, the book of Romans, look at Genesis. What they're not used to you doing is reducing their views to skepticism itself. And see, that's the way you got to go forward. All right, now, uh, and I have two more points. Uh, number five. What is the mo motives of the new atheism today? Well, here's kind of the posture of the new atheists. They would just say, well, I, I just don't see it. I don't see the facts. If I, if I don't believe in God, it's, it's just because I don't see it. Uh, for, like, for instance, Bertrand Russell, when someone asked him this question, they said, uh, what will you do if you die and you go to heaven and you have to stand before God at, at judgment? What will you say? And Russell, kind of putting on his best English air and accent, said, I would say to him, sir... You have failed to provide me with adequate evidence. And see, I think that's the posture of atheism. They try to say, uh, I'm a disciple of the data. I, I, I just don't see the facts, so I'm aligning myself with what I can only find in the evidence. But that's not very believable to me. Uh, I don't, uh, if you don't believe in something, and some, some of you have heard me say this, I've picked it up from uh, D'Souza. 
He says, uh, if you don't believe in something, you just kind of carry on as if that something doesn't exist. He says, for instance, um, I don't believe in leprechauns. <laughs> but you don't find me debating advocates of leprechauns. He said, you won't find me writing books called The Leprechaun Delusion. <laughs> leprechauns are not good. <laughs> Why leprechauns are not great? The death of leprechauns. <laughs> <No>. <laughs> or like Shakespeare said it, Methinks thou dost protest too much. <laughs> All right? If you don't believe in something, you just kind of carry on your life as if something doesn't exist. As a matter of fact, Hitchens said, and that's why I like Hitchens a lot in terms of the new atheist. He said, I'm not so much um, an atheist that I can prove that there's not a God as I am an anti-theist. I'm against the Christian God. I think that's a telling thing in the life of, uh, of the atheist. So what is this motive? Why do they do this? Well, take, take, for instance, what religion says. There's something called ultimate justice. Or what the Christians, what we would say is the final judgment. And what we say that there, there is a record being kept. And maybe there's a God who's omniscient, who can see everything, and is keeping record in a book. Of every deed that we do. Every thought we think. Now, I don't know about you, but how many of you have felt the pressure of that? Even though you know a God of grace. Now, I'm going to tell you, I think that's the real issue. It's like the old timers singing that song. You know, there's a little sea at night watching me. There's a little sea They seem kind of mean. Watching you and your neighbor too. <laughs> Right? And so uh, for, the, for the atheist and for people in general, that, that kind of uh, intense uh, scrutiny of your life can be a weight. And so what has, and, and this is what happens. If you, here's what John says. This is the condemnation that's come in the world. Not that light has come, but that men, what? Love darkness rather than light because they're Deeds are evil. And so what, what atheism is doing, and I think it's very seductive, is offering this generation a way out. So if I don't want to obey the law, atheism gives them a very clever way of getting around that. It's simple. You do away with the lawgiver. There is no God. There are no laws. There are no codes. There are no co uh, commandments. You can live the way you want to live. Dorchevsky, in uh, his book called The Brothers uh, Karmazov, writes, If God is not, everything is permitted. All right? And in that book, he, this in, in Dorchevsky is a warning. And, and it's, a, it's a, 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 a challenge to say, look, if God is not, anything is permissible. People can do anything they want. And he says, this is going to be the bloodiest century we've ever faced. In a way, we find atheist prophecy. <laughs> and it's absolutely true it came to pass. But uh, uh, Aldous Huxley, and, for the new, and, and represented in him in his book, The Brave New World. Anyone read that book, The Brave New World? Okay, and, and I think for the new atheism, they're not aligning themselves with Dorchevsky. They're saying uh, this idea of atheism is a kind of a thrilling revelation because if God is not, everything's permissible. You can live the way you want to live. And so Huxley said this, we objected to morality because it interfered with our sexual freedom. We objected to political and economic system because it was unjust. The supporters of these systems claimed that in some way they embodied the meaning, a Christian meaning, they insisted, of the world. There was one admirably simple method of confuting these pe people and at the same time, catch this, justifying ourselves. We could deny the world had any meaning. So they embraced atheism because it allowed them the freedom to do away with God. So I think the issue that you're facing and what you're going to have to challenge them to see is that atheism is offering young people kind of a reason-governed life, but more seductively, the promise of moral liberation. You can live the way you want to. Right? And finally, tonight, what do you do? How, what do we do with this? Well, I think this is where we should be. First of all, we need to take the new atheism seriously. 
That means, unfortunately, you've got to read. You've got to study. You, you know how to witness to a Baptist, hopefully, by now. You know how to witness to a Trinitarian, hopefully, by now. Or you're getting sharper in terms... Of, I think the same is true with atheism. I think you need to take it seriously, not as a threat, but as an opportunity. Brother Mooney, uh, who, somebody grab a Twitter feed. Who has uh, who can grab a Twitter feed? Sure. Pull up Brother Mooney's Twitter, Derek, and look for that wonderful quote by the poet that talks about the cracks. Get uh, less the light through. All right, and he he says uh, it's not a threat, but it's it's an opportunity. An opportunity for us to m remove obstacles so that people can make a step of faith. Now, here's the issue. Uh, atheism is like uh, a bunch of uh, overgrown brambles. And you have to cut them away and trim them away so people can see the cross. They can see God and then make a step of faith. All right, now, I think that's uh, where we're at today. So show them the hopelessness of their own position. Uh, they're, they're arguing for, for morals. And, and if you get on a college campus today, one of my favorite illustrations is a Christian apologist was arguing for Christian morals on a campus. And if you do that, and if your students do that, and your saints do that, guess what? They're going to look like idiots. But one man was doing that on a ca campus, and, and he was arguing for morals. And then he says to... Uh, the crowd, he says, you know, I think these things are right. And this guy comes up and he says, look, you can't argue for that. I, I like Nietzsche and kind of the, the atheism and this distressness and there's no meaning to life at all. And so everybody's kind of nodding their head and he says to the guy, and this is one of the most powerful illustrations I've ever heard on, on, on treating atheism. He says, if I take a baby and I cut a baby up in front of you, have I done something wrong? Right? And the man was very consistent with his atheism. He said, I wouldn't like what you've done. And I wouldn't want you to do what you've done. But no, I couldn't say you've done anything wrong. And now the man looks like an idiot. And then the apologist says to him, Sir, you've denied the fact of evil and the face of evil. But not even you can get away from the feeling of evil. You need to figure out why that's deep inside your heart. Because we're created in the image of God. And we know intuitively there's a sense of justice. Did you find it, Derek? No, I'm still looking. Okay, Brother Mooney, yes, you found it? Read it for us. Ring the bell that can still ring. Okay, ring, okay, this is a great, is it Cohen? Who's the author? Uh, Leonard Cohen. Yeah, good. Uh, ring the bell that still can ring. Make, make that clear sound. Yeah? Forget the perfect offering. Forget the perfect offering. Get involved. Don't wait till you're... Uh, I mean, you don't need a... Someone said, I wish I had a pocket Kilman, a little mini app with Brother Kilman that I could put in my pocket. <laughs> don't wait till you do that. Ring the bell. Take what you can. Go out in the streets. And I guarantee you, if you look, if you equip yourself this way, we taught a... Sit now, I'm going to tell you, you're accountable now. Because brother, we, we did a whole session on atheism uh, and, and Islam uh, as well in, in young adults. And Brother, brother uh, Barkas told me, we did that session on Islam. And guess what? I bumped into a Muslim guy the next day. Okay, so I'm just going to expect God's going to put people in your path. Okay, ring the bell. Yes, don't try to bring a perfect offering. There's a crack in everything. There's a crack in everything. That's how the light is in. And, but that's how the light gets in. The fact that we're living in this crazy, chaotic culture. The fact that atheism can't have meaning. It's the cracks. It's that, look, the crisis is the opportunity. And it lets the light get in. I know our culture's nuts, and it's fallen to pieces. And it's cracking. The Christian foundation is cracking in terms of uh, what's... But well, I'm going to tell you that the foundation of our society is cracking. Because secularism is not working either. So don't worry when the world starts shaking. The cracks are how the light gets through. Okay? Oh, man. I, I was going to read you parable of a madman. Do, 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 yes. do it. Do you have five minutes? Yes, sir. Yes. Yes. This is, uh, again, one of the best resources for witnessing to atheism. It's by Frederick Nietzsche called Parable of the Madman, written in 1882. 
He says, have you not heard of that madman who lit a lantern in the bright morning hours, ran to the marketplace and cried incessantly, I seek God, I seek God. Now what you have to understand, in this parable, Nietzsche considers himself the madman. And he's running into the culture of his day that's turning atheist, and he's confronting it with his parable, with his teaching. He says, and as many who did not believe in God were standing about just then, he provoked much laughter. Has he got lost, asked one? Did he lose his way like a child, Ask another? Or is he hiding? Is he afraid of us? Has he gone on a voyage, immigrated? Thus they yelled and laughed. You can almost hear Elijah at Mount Carmel, can't you? The madman jumped into their midst and pierced them with his eyes. Whether is God, he cried, I will tell you, we have killed him, you and I. All of us are his murderers. But how did we do this? How could we drink up the sea? Who gave us the sponge to wipe away the entire horizon? What were we doing when we unchained the earth from the sun? Whether is it moving now? Whether are we moving away from all suns? Are we not plunging continually, backward, sideways, forward, in all direction? Is there still any up or down? Are we not straying as though through infinite nothing? Do we not feel the breath of empty space? Hath it not become colder? Is not the night continually closing in on us? Do we not need to light lanterns in the morning? Do we, not he uh, do we hear nothing as of yet the noise of the grave diggers who are burying God? Do we smell nothing as yet of the divine decomposition? God's too decomposed. God is dead. God remains dead. And we have killed him. What is Nietzsche saying? There are no rights. There's no wrong. There are no morals. There's no direction, there's no meaning, there's no purpose. Uh, for those of you who are in uh, contemporary theology, there's no upper floor. <coughs> How, and listen to what he says. How shall we comfort ourselves, the murderer of all murderers? What was holiest and mightiest of all that the world has yet owned has bled to death under our knives? Who will wipe the blood off us? What water is there for us to clean ourselves? What festivals of atonement, what sacred games shall we have to invent? He said, look, we cannot, we need religion. How can you govern man? How can you tell them not to hurt another person? What sacred games will we have to invent? Is not the greatness of this deed too great for us? Must we ourselves not become gods to simply appear worthy of it? There has never been a greater de deed. And whoever is born after us for the sake of this deed, he will belong to a higher history than all history hitherto. Here the madman fell silent and looked again at his listeners. And they too were silent and stared at him in astonishment. At last he threw down his lantern on the ground and it broke to pieces and went out. Nietzsche says, you're not ready to hear the implications of your own belief. He says, I have come too early, he said then. My time is not yet. This tremendous event is still on its way, still wandering. It has not yet reached the ears of men. Lightning and thunder require time. The light of the stars require time. Deeds, though done, still require time to be seen and heard. This deed is still more distant from them than the most distant stars. And yet they have done it themselves. It has been related that on that same day, the madman forced his way into several churches and there st struck up his requiem. Led out and called into account, he said always to have replied nothing but, what are these churches now if they are not the tombs and sepulchers of God? What was he dealing with? The liberalism of his day, liberal Christianity, that had lost the Bible. The pessimism of of, uh, and, and, and weird doctrine of guys like Schleiermacher, Bultmann, and Kierkegaard, and all of the people that help contribute, you ready, to the death of God. Lauren, you had a, a debate with a friend. And he was, he was uh, at an apostolic church before, right? Was he a backslider? He never, he kind of hung around the church a little bit. But he went and got involved in philosophy in, in college. And was kind of debating that you can make meaning for life in college. 
And what you end up doing is if you quote the Bible, you'll never get any headway. So what I started to do was to, to press him for the consistency of atheism. Can you say there are no things like morals? Right, wrong. Can you give up a term like justice? Can you give up a meaning, a purpose? And I, I, I had him, I said, have you read The Parable of a Madman by Frederick Nietzsche? And when he read it, he said, we need, we need to talk. Why? Because when you make them face uh, the emptiness of their belief, sometimes you can find there, you pull the brambles aside and show them the hopelessness, and no man can live without hope. All right, so what are you saying, Brother Kilman? I think you can find, if you give yourself to a little bit of study, the best way to face these new moments, but not only survive as Christians, but thrive and equip your people and your saints and your students to walk on campuses and not be 75, look, it's 7 to 9 out of 10. That's a, ca that's a catastrophe right now. But I think not only can you help them survive, you can help them thrive. You ready? As missionaries on the campuses of America.